Michael Heiser, point 12. The warning of Paul in Romans 8, 28 to 29 is interesting for the position I, Paul, uh, I, Michael Heiser, am suggesting. He does not use the word election in the description. Really? Let's read it. In Romans 8, 28, which reads, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. He's addressing the church here. In Rome, and all churches are part of the body of Christ. To those who are called according to his purpose. The Greek word platois, rendered are called, means to be called out. That's election. Invited, chosen, appointed, elected. Does he miss that? And in Romans 8.30, which reads, And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Election is there. You can use this different words to mean the same thing. I don't know if he knows that. The Greek word eklesin, rendered he called, also has election of you. Does this man even read carefully? It is rendered called in the sent, in the verse, which indicates that those that God predestined to be conformed to the righteous image of his Son, Jesus Christ, he called to believe in his Son's atonement unto a declaration of righteousness and an eternal redemption. That's called justification. Does he bother reading that? And then declared them glorified. We are in our bodies now, mortal bodies with a sin nature, yet God looks upon us believers in Jesus Christ as already destined to be glorified. To be called here means to be chosen, selected from the Greek noun eklogen, meaning chosen, elected. So he's making some ridiculous, he's not even reading the text. So the Greek word eklogen, when he called, means called forth. Because there's ek, out of. So called out of, emphatic. In the case of verse 830, individuals were called forth by God to choose of their own volition to believe in his son, to be justified and glorified. Individuals, not whole groups of people. They're largely Gentiles because Rome was largely comprised of Gentile people. And this occurred precisely in accordance with God's predestination, his decree. You have to look at how all these words, election, foreknowledge, decree, called, elected, so on. So those that God predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, to be conformed, in other words, to the righteousness of God in their experience. They've got the position of justification. Now they're going to live out their years in their temporal life, get a new resurrection body, and then have the righteousness of God in their experience and live out into eternity. That's a great salvation. He called to believe in his son's atonement unto justification, being declared then to have a righteousness from God in their position, which they all did of their own volition. Notice, God called, you cooperated with your own free will choice, resulting in eternal redemption and eternal life, which you're going to receive in your own wonderful experience, the joy of having perfect righteousness in your experience, no sinning. This implies that God foreknew what would occur. Why? Because he predetermined it by his decree. Yet all was to be in accordance with the volition of the individual. <clears throat> now, Dr. Heiser doesn't come anywhere near what that these verses say, 29 and 30 of Romans 8. Thus all who are predestined are to be called. They are called by God's sovereign decree, which is part of the process of predestinating something. And since it is a sovereign God who does the predestinating, <clears throat> all who are called inevitably choose to believe in Jesus Christ <clears throat> of their own volition. That's how sovereign he is. Let you make up your own mind with a little drawing. But he's chosen you to do that, and you choose of your own volition. And you get the unbelievable experience of living a life of righteousness with no flaws whatsoever. We get rid of that terrible sin nature within ourselves. Hence, all who are called are justified, declared righteous. You're declared, this is your position, you're just as righteous as my son is, even though in your temporal life, with this flawed, sin-natured body, it isn't so in your experience. But God looks upon you as if you have the righteousness of his son. <clears throat> and thus, whom God justified, it is stipulated in the final phrase of verse 830, 
God glorified. The verb glorified is in the aorist tense, referring to an action that has already been completed. The glorification of the believer has already been indicated in Romans as a sure thing in the future. What a great thing. Why doesn't he work on the words that Paul wrote? Far better than the interpretation that Paul Heiser, uh, 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 Michael Heiser wants to use for his own end. <clears throat> this is why a simple cursory review of the passage is wholly insufficient. Take it word by word, especially when one misses keywords in that passage, which he wholly did. For example, if a particular election is specifically applicable to individuals of this church age, then it cannot be applied to one kind of people or another or another time frame or dispensation or economy according to the sovereignty of God. It is furthermore applicable to salvation unto eternal life and that kind of salvation for individuals alone. That's why you have to look at the passage and, and you marry it to the context. Elect, chosen refers to chosen ones, the selected out ones, those who are appointed by God for a certain object to go. And what is that? Choosing to be believe in Jesus Christ for eternal life. Okay. So we're going on to point 13. If you don't read the Bible word for word, you're not doing justice to what the author actually wrote. Paul is the author. I would respect him. He's a, the great apostle. Michael Hauser goes on. He does not speak of Jew only, Paul. He tells us more broadly that God predestined the salvation of some, a remnant, the composition of which he will explain in the next three chapters. He's not doing that. He's talking about individuals and their salvation unto eternal life. Not a remnant of of a group of people who are chosen to be God's client nation representing him on the earth. Different subject. Well, Romans 8.28, he goes on, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. So he's repeating himself here, but totally misinterpreting it. But let's find out. Let's see what Paul really meant in Romans 8, 28 to 30. Notice that there is a lot of what Paul wrote leading up to this passage, some of which might have a bearing on what the passage means and does not mean, although it is a far better thing to read from the beginning of the letter to the Roman believers. Nevertheless, in, in essence, because we don't have enough time, here's an excerpt from Romans 8, 28 to 30 with a few excerpts from key passages from Romans prior to chapter 8 that provide a more complete view of the context <clears throat> within Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, 28. And we have known that to those loving God, all things do work together for godly good to those who are called according to his purpose. So Paul and his associates have known that the children of God, those who are called according to God's purpose, who choose to love God, will have all things work together for godly good. So, the phrase, which is based on the Greek word oidomen, rendered we have known, is in the perfect tense, which signifies a completed action in the past with ongoing results in the present. So this is the action. It is an in indicative mood, statement of fact. It speaks of having known a statement of fact. The word we refers to Paul, the author, and apostles, and his associates. It is they who are in view as having known that the ones who love God will have all things work together for godly good. The word good here, to be consistent with the context, must refer to godly good in conformity with what? God's righteousness. But how can we do that in a resurrection unless we get our resurrection bodies? Well, the Greek phrase in verse 828 rendered is it tois agapasin ton teon, where agapasin is a present participle noun in the date of cases, literally, to the ones loving God. So as your ongoing loving, expressing self, uh, self-sacrificial agape love toward God, it is rendered to those loving God, 
Hence the phrase referred, that's in view, hence the phrase refers to individuals who demonstrate a godly love for God, since this is an activity only possible with children of God. Believers, because they, then they're going to be elect because they believe. They, they, they believe because they're elect, and they, they're elect because they believe. Believers, because only they have the spirit to lead them to that end. And because unbelievers are always controlled by the sin nature and cannot please God with godly love. So then only children of God, believers, are in view. And only those believers who maintain their love of God will have all things work together for good. So we can't talk about groups of people, elect and non-elect, in that group. We only talk about believers. So right away we have a problem with context. The last phrase of verse 828 clarifies that the verse is exclusively addressing children of God, believers with the Greek words rendered in the Young's Little Translation, to those who are called according to his purpose. How many are called according to his purpose? Only believers in Jesus Christ for eternal life, regardless of what group of people you belong to, because this is done one individual at a time. And that's the church addressed in Rome, <clears throat> the church, body of believers. Different persuasions, mostly Gentile, because it's Rome. But there are Jewish believers in that church as well. We're talking about each individual who trusted alone in Christ alone to be a born-again believer. And this is then makes you part of the body of believers who are all called according to God's purpose, because now we're children of God, born of God. So the Greek word kletois means called. It is evidently referring to God's sovereign calling of certain individuals to faith in Christ, unto justification and eternal redemption. Once you believe, you have justification, declared righteous, and you have eternal redemption as a surety in your, in your uh, future. Previous verses, which have the same individuals in view in verse 828, indicate such individuals as heirs of God and will be glorified with Jesus Christ, but only if they suffer with him for righteousness' sake. They'll still make it to heaven, but their glorification with Jesus Christ at such a great level requires that you dedicate your life towards him as a Christian and grow in the faith, and you'll have some suffering. And they are children of God. They're described as having the first fruit of the Spirit and the promise of eternal redemption, 823, and they're saved, 824, and saints, 827. You've got to go over these things. Hence, we can conclude that those who are called to God's purpose in verse 828 are limited to believers. This implies that not all individuals are called of God according to his purpose because not all individuals become believers. <clears throat> Finally, 828 to, uh, 829 to 830 corroborates that believers are exclusively in view relative to God's calling according to his purpose. Whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of, his, of the glory of his Son, and that we will be, regardless of how we conduct our life in this temporal life, which has bearing on what kind of rewards you get and the, 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 the immensity of the great glorification you get, but we'll get some of the glory of the Son as we are, are positioned in Christ with his righteousness. And regardless of how we believe uh, or behave, we still have the glory of the Son as a sure thing in our future. So he might be the firstborn among many brethren. We'll be one of the brethren of which he is firstborn. We're brothers to Christ. Moreover, whom he predestined, those he called, whom he called, those, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. So the beginning of chapter 5 provides corroboration of the principle of all things working together for godly good to those believers who demonstrate their love for God via perseverance through suffering. More on this next time.